All right, uh, why don't we get started here? Thanks everyone for coming today in person or virtually, really appreciate you all being here today. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to say that the, the Field Museum acknowledges that it resides within the traditional homelands of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. Museum recognizes and is grateful for the original peoples who laid the foundation for the city of Chicago and for the diverse indigenous nations that reside in Chicago today. Uh, today, I'd like to, uh, I'm really pleased to welcome Yoel Stewart, uh, who's an assistant professor of evolutionary biology at Loyola University. Uh, Yoel's work focuses on understanding evolutionary patterns and processes and really utilizes a diverse array of organismal groups spanning from Daphnia to gnolls to sticklebacks, all kinds of different organismal groups to really address these fascinating research questions. Uh, he's published numerous papers in extremely prestigious journals, such as Science, Nature, Ecology, and Evolution, Tree, Annual Reviews. Um, and he's really devoted a lot of time also to mentoring students, which I, I find quite important. He's mentored over 40 undergrads and, mas and three master's students, and he's published a number of uh, papers with them as, as first author as well, which I think is a really important um, focus to have. Uh, Yoel earned his undergrad from UC Davis and then followed that up with a, a PhD from Harvard University, uh, working with Jonathan Losos on Anoles. And he's received a number of NSF grants, including an NSF Eager grant to better understand the effects uh, of radiation, like nuclear radiation, on um, resurrected Daphnia lineages that were exposed to nuclear testing in the, the 50s. And then he also is awarded a NSF career grant this year in which he will utilize a long-term data set um, of fossil sticklebacks to link macroevolutionary and microevolutionary processes. And I think he's gonna tell us a little bit more about that today. So thank you very much, Yoel. Hi, Matt, thank you for the introduction and the invitation. It was a pleasure to receive an email a couple of weeks ago inviting me here. Um, thanks to you all for being here in person, and I can't tell who's at home, but thank you at home. Um, yeah, today I want to talk about some new work that I've got going on fossil stickleback. I'm not a paleontologist um, yet. Um, I definitely, you know, sort of worked on uh, the ecology and evolution of anoles and extant stickleback before this in my graduate work and postdoc work, and um, I'd say the fossil work has sort of picked up in the last couple of years since I got to Loyola. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you about some of the stuff that we're doing in that system today. <laughs> so if, if I was gonna describe myself, I'd say I'm a mic microevolutionist at heart, right? What are um, sort of intraspecific patterns of diversity and how do those patterns arise? Um, and I have two main questions. One is how fast is evolution, um, right? Since Darwin, because uh, you have to start talks with Darwin. Um, evolutionary biologists have tended to think that evolution is slow, as, um, right? He wrote in The Origin, uh, natural selection will act very slowly at long intervals of time, according to geology, right? Ge geological change is what inspired him. Um, and so that was kind of the dominant idea in the field for a long time, little tiny changes by natural selection acting slowly. But, you know, ironically, uh, Darwin's very own finches and the work of Peter and Rosemary Grant uh, in the last 30, 40 years or so has shown that, you know, you can get this microevolutionary change within across a single or few generations, right? The environment changes drastically, you get a big drought and there's selection for change in beak size and all of a sudden beak size drops um, significantly, right? So at least in its microevolutionary framework, we can, we can get at these questions of rate. 
And then my other big question is um, how repeatable is evolution, right? We have this evolutionary process. Is it predictable? And this goes back to Gould's famous question, of course, um, famous thought experiment. If you were to rewind the tape of life and play it forward again, um, do you get the same results or different results? What are the relative roles of contingency and determinism in the evolutionary process? And Gould was of the camp, especially if you went back far enough, that life would be very, very different. If we played it forward again, chance would rule all. But um, Simon Conway Morris, who Gould actually drew a lot of examples from um, to argue for contingency, sort of hit back with his own book saying, uh, his own book called Life Solution, basically saying, wait, 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 evolution is supremely predictable, convergence rules all, um, and we can really have a sense for what evolution would do if we were to play the tape back and forward. And so I've pursued these questions, especially the questions of speed using anolis lizards on small islands in Florida, uh, interacting with um, invasive anoles, looking at competition and how competition drives habitat use change and evolution. And then um, I've looked at the repeatability questions using lake stream populations of stickleback, um, which have repeatedly colonized independently these watersheds in British Columbia and how are they adapting to lakes? How are they adapting to streams? Are they doing it the same way each time and not. I'm not gonna talk about that stuff today, um, but I do want to note that these are kind of frustrating questions to attempt. Right? If you're asking questions about the speed of evolution and the rate of evolution, you need time to sort of measure those rates. You also need space. It's easy. Sometimes you can substitute spatial replication for temporal um, length of time. And so um, often you're sort of left at the end of these studies being like, well, is this an idiosyncratic case or can we make some generalizations? And so where my research program is starting to go is to try and find evolutionary sequences. Right? Can we actually get length of time? And if we can, replication for where we can watch a single lineage evolve through time. And so we tried to do this with that nuclear radiation study that Matt mentioned. Um, where we went to lakes in Utah, use sediment cores to dig down into the, into the sediment layers and try and go back to before the nuclear testing era in the 1950s, get these um, eggs. You can see there's some eggs right here in the Staphnia. They, they lay these dormant eggs every year um, that settle to the bottom and they're supposed to hatch the next season to restart the population, but sometimes they get covered up. And so you can actually go back in time, get these eggs and try and rehatch them. And then you can ask questions about, well, what was the population like 100 years ago versus today. Um, and so we were wondering if radiation had any effect. We isolated about 4,500 aphipia from three lakes, these dormant eggs from three lakes um, across the last 100 years and we hatched one. So that project failed, that's okay. That one was from the 1950s. So the conclusion is that radiation is good for dormant eggs. Um, so anyways, we tried and it didn't work. But a place where I hope that we're gonna be a little bit more successful is another one of these sort of lineages um, in this Gasterosteus derissus. This is a three-spine stickleback um, where we have about 20,000 years of evolution that happened about 10 million years ago where we catch this adaptive process in action and we're gonna ask some questions about the genetics of change in the fossil record, the geometry of change in the fossil record and some speciation perhaps. Um, and so that's some of the work that I'll talk about today. <clears throat> so before I get into individual projects, I wanna introduce the system. Um, this is, like I said, a 10 million year old lake bed. And it's, the lake was dominated by diatoms when it was a lake. And those diatoms would settle every year and they'd create these um, sort of layers of sediment. And so this mine is in Fernley, Nevada. It's actually a quarry. So a mining company came along and took off the top of the mountain, uh, exposing the diatomite. And you can see that there's these layers here and I'll pass around <coughs> fossil for the folks in the room. Um, we've got a couple of stickleback on the front of it. And then you pull it sideways, you can see the layers. We think that these layers are annual um, deposits of sort of diatoms during end of summer and then clays during the winter. And so you can do things like take a ruler 
um, make some assumptions about how thick each one of those layers is, and you can measure where everything is in relative time. Okay, so we use these um, volcanic ashes and, and um, output from fires, ashes to sort of place ourselves in relative time, and then you can measure backwards and forwards from there. <laughs> and another cool thing about this is that the lake was, went from vertical to horizontal in, um, through geological processes. And so you can actually just sort of walk backwards and forwards through time and make your collections in various places. Um, and so for example, my collaborator, Mike Bell, and uh, one of his first studies that he published on this has about 100,000 years of stickleback evolution documented um, at about 5,000 year resolution. So we can really watch change through time in this population and a number of traits that we know are interesting ecologically from modern stickleback. And the story is roughly this, the first 93,000 years or so of this deposit um, is pretty static. You have essentially a low armor stickleback where it's got um, a very reduced pelvic girdle. So now I'll pass around some, some extant forms and you can try and look and see if you can find the pelvis and the pelvic spine. Um, those are nice so if you want to take one out, you can. Um, <clears throat> but the story in the fossil record here is that you have a low armored fish, um, rudimentary sort of vestigial pelvic girdle, very few dorsal spine, or usually one sort of vestigial dorsal spine. And um, that lasts for about 93,000 years. And then within kind of the resolution of the study, you get this sudden jump to this high armored form. Three, or sorry, three dorsal spines. And now you get this full pelvis where you have this big girdle, looks like this right here, with an ascending branch, a plate on the belly, and then two big spines. These are used for defense. Um, they make it hard for predators to sort of crunch on the fish. Okay, so you get this replacement almost instantaneously within the resolution of our fossil record. And then the next 20,000 years are a reduction in armor again. So what we think happened, and we're investigating this right now, what we think happened is that in this first part, this section that I'm sort of calling lineage one, um, it was a shallow, shallow lake bed um, without any piscivorous vertebrate predators it favored this low armored form. We have some evidence from stable isotopes and diatoms that the, the lake got deep all of a sudden. So maybe there was a bunch of rain or something else changed in the broader lake basin. The lake got deep, probably allowing these high armored forms to flood in. They replaced the low armored form. We think it's an ecological replacement because we don't find any hybrids and it's a short amount of time. So maybe not, maybe not a selective event where you're getting the selection for higher armor. So we think it's a replacement event. And then that second lineage starts to evolve. <clears throat> and we think that this evolution back towards low armor. So this is just that second, second part of the sequence. So just focusing on the lineage to the right side of this. This is 20,000 years. It's a different sample at about 250 year resolution. If you um, test various evolutionary models against the reduction of say the number of dorsal spines or the number of um, armor plates on the back or the um, sort of size of the pelvis. The model that best fits is this ornstein ullenbeck model, which is a model essentially of sort of directional selection towards a new optimum and then stabilizing selection around that optimum. So we think that natural selection is what's driving this reduction here. Okay, questions on this system, the basic background. We're gonna dive into a few different stories on this. I just wanna make sure everybody's on the same page. Actually, yeah. just a clarification. Yeah. Uh, so you're not like, you're looking for... Okay, so just a clarification to, yeah. to, to make sure I understand. So in, in your graphs, we're looking forward in time. So your zero yes. is not the present. Is Sometime. Yes. Okay. So okay. this is, this happened 10 million years ago. Uh -huh. This is the 
that replacement event, right? The lineage two showed up right here. And then we're going forward through time as we go to the right. Okay. Yeah. That's a very sort of extant neontologist way of showing things. Usually paleontologists have it sort of up there. It seems like the strength of the armor could be influenced by the animal's mobility, the ability to escape. If you're strongly armored, stand and face whatever's after you, or be thinner, more agile, get away. Yeah, yeah. So studies of extant stickleback, um, there's lots of populations that have low armor, lots of populations. So sorry, the marine environment, all of the fish in the marine environment are high armor um, because there's a lot of isoverse predators around in the marine environment, we think. There's also lots of bone building ions in the marine environment. So it's not costly to make that armor. Um, as soon as you move to freshwater in these extant populations, almost all of them reduce armor, partly because fewer predators and partly because there's less bone building ions. So it's costly now. The few freshwater populations that maintain armor have a lot of piscivorous or vertebrate predators. Um, so there's, it does seem to be more about predation rather than, than swimming or mobility. In the marine environment where they swim a lot, they're all heavily armored. So that seems to be the case. Could you include any tail measurements in that? Yeah, we've, we've done things like measure um, you know, with the caudal peduncle and various, various fin measurements, they're pectoral fin swimmers. And so I think um, if I remember the data right, stream fish have bigger pectoral fins than lake fish because they have to um, you know, deal with current a lot. Um, but the armor doesn't seem, doesn't seem to influence their swimming too much in part because they're pectoral fin swimmers too. I think you answered my question. So like, um, so this is like a lake um, and the incursion would have been from the Marine, do you think, or? No, so this is another good question. And there's a few quarries elsewhere. <clears throat> we, this is mostly fresh water, but again, we're gonna try and do some stabilized step analyses to confirm. Um, what we think the ecological difference is here is that this just seems to be a shallow deposit without a lot of fish predators and that other lakes in the basin are deeper with fish predators. And so that's what's maintaining the armor in the other places, but it's, it's relatively inland. And so there's not a lot of sort of saltwater marine input here. But, but in terms of like nominally, these are the same species, just different local ecotypes or whatever. Yeah. 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 We, they're all derisive. It's just intraspecific variation. Okay. Other questions on the system? Yeah. Do you have a good sense of what the assumptions were like? You're saying that there was some movement that sort of separated the fish, but like, I don't know, I guess that's. Yeah. The, in, this, in this deposit, yeah. never found a piscivorous fish. Okay. And that is based on fossil records. That's based on a ton of rock that's been quarried out of this okay. deposit looking like stickleback are everywhere in this deposit and there's almost nothing else. Yeah, and so um, a lot of the inference is a couple steps for sure. Yeah. I, I don't know much about fish, <laughs> um, but I was wondering if there's um, any like plastic response in armoring like like either with age or just generally like in like extant lineages. Yeah, so how much how much does plasticity matter? Not too much. There's a strong genetic component, at least for presence, absence, and number. Um, there are lots of modifier genes that, that affect size. And so in, there's a few Baltic populations of stickleback, for example, that are under selection to lose um, lateral plates. But they don't have the allelic variation that allows them to just drop lateral plates entirely. Yeah. And so what's happened in those populations is, is the lateral plates have shrunk, right? And so they're still trying to, I don't know if that's, that's both probably plastic and genetically controlled, but they are, there are this is a polygenic sort of stuff. Um, 
and it's probably both. Thanks. Yep. Okay. So I'm gonna tell probably two stories today, probably not time for three, um, where we were using existing data to understand something about evolution in this system. Um, in particular, we'll talk about the genetics of armor loss, um, and then we'll probably spend some time on trying to detect reproductive isolation in the fossil record. So we'll start with genetics. Um, this is <coughs> work done with Mike Bell, my collaborator, um, who generously allowed me to play around with some of his data, and then Matt Travis at Rowan University, um, who collected a lot of these data. And this work was motivated more or less by, um, you know, it's nice to know the genetic architecture of adaptive change. Um, in the fossil record, that's difficult, of course. You can't do quantitative genetics very well in the fossil record. Um, it's very hard to acquire DNA. We don't often have a, even if we have phenotypes, we don't often have the link to the genotypes. Um, but it's nice to do, because if you can, right, it might inform in the fossil record where you have so much more temporal scope, right? It might inform um, our ideas of how microevolution translates into bigger patterns. Um, so for example, Gene Hunt had this nice paper on ostracods where he was able to measure, um, you know, a bunch of different sort of geometric morphometric characters on these shells, ask about genetic covariances within those characters, and then watch how, whether or not those covariances bias trade evolution for a long time. But these are questions of constraint versus the sort of power of natural selection. <clears throat> um, so it can be nice to do if, if we can if we can get there. And that's what I'm going to try and make the case today that we've done for these fossil stickleback. Um, we can pick up the genetic architecture of this armor reduction. Okay, so just a reminder: we just went over it. We think that natural selection is what's driving. Um, reduction in armor for dorsal spines and that pelvis. Um, and today what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the pelvis, where we have this kind of full pelvis, um, two big spines, belly plate, ascending branch for about 3,000 years after that replacement event, right? the highly armored form comes in, and then you get this rapid reduction towards low pelvic score. Why focus on the pelvis? Um, because we know so much about it in these extant, closely related three spine sticklebacks. So, extant sticklebacks, they also go through this full pelvis, through down to missing pelvis and reduced pelvis states. Um, there's one study that came out that looked at a bunch of populations around the world, and there's at least 49 recorded instances of independent pelvic reduction and loss. So it seems to be this um, adaptive trait when you get into fresh water. <laughs> and as a sort of major trait, people have been interested in it genetically for a while. So we know something about the genetic basis of this. Um, it seems to be a single gene of large effect that's responsible for a lot of pelvic reduction. It's called PIDX1. A number of QTL studies have, have picked that up where PIDX1 is involved in reducing the spine lengths, girdle sizes, um, the ascending branch size. And um, PIDX1 is interesting as a candidate gene because it can be sort of pelvic specific, right? PIDX1 is involved in a number of different developmental processes. And so knocking out the coding region of PIDX1 um, leads to death. It's a lethal mutation. But if you um, sort of knock out the hind limb pelvic specific enhancers, then you can get pelvic responses and things like mice um, and experimentally in the lab without screwing up anything else. Okay, so it seems like a good spot. Um, studies in three-spine stickleback, studies in nine-spine stickleback, um, QTL crosses have sort of shown that PIDX1 seems to be responsible not just for three spines, but also for nine spines, which are 10 million years diverged. So it seems to be getting tapped in both intraspecifically in multiple populations and then across species. And one cool thing about PIDX1 is it leaves a phenotypic signature. It seems like it would be useful in the fossil record. <clears throat> if you knock out PIDX1 expression in the pelvis, you end up with um, vestiges that are larger on the left side than the right. So here in these mice knockouts, you end up with these smaller 
smaller sort of vestigial limbs, and then this asymmetry between left and right, you get that in stickleback as well. And sort of intriguingly, you also get it in manatee. So um, Shapiro and David Kingsley and folks went to some museum collections of manatees where they knew and right side of the pelvic vestiges and they saw that in manatees, you also have left larger vestiges. <clears throat> they didn't do the genetics and I don't know why they didn't because they have so many resources to do it, but they haven't done it. But um, at the very least that suggests that maybe this PIDX1 is something that could be used across vertebrates um, as, a, as a way to reduce pelvis, pelvises and hind limbs when you need to. Seems like a fairly good candidate gene. We have the repeated independent use of it across millions of years of divergence, gene of large effect. <clears throat> PIDX1 is one of only a handful of genes known to be related to asymmetry in vertebrate development. Um, and then we should be able to pick up its phenotypes in the fossil record. So let's hypothesize that PIDX1 is driving pelvic reduction in the fossils. Remember those plots of, of reduction through time. If that's true, then one deduction might be that um, if it's a gene of large effect, we should expect sort of discrete phenotypic classes as we go from fully armored down to low armored form. Okay. So <clears throat> we got at this by going to um, a collection of 18 samples from this rock record separated by about a thousand years. Um, Mike scored them into various pelvic score categories, three being full, zero being everything gone, and one being basically down to these little vestiges of the sort of anterior part of the plate on the belly. And here's a table suggesting that we do get a shift in discrete, discrete phenotype classes. So at the beginning, now time is running down, right? So here's the replacement. That high armor form shows up. All of the individuals have a full pelvis. We go uh, for several samples at a thousand year intervals where everybody is full. And then you start to get these jumps to having a basically purely vestigial pelvis. And it kind of goes three, two, one. Show that visually, it's kind of hard to show 19 time slices on a plot, so bear with me here. Here's that replacement event, oldest. Next, next, next. And if you keep sort of bouncing back and forth, you see that we're all at three on pelvic score. And then you quickly transition through a state of two and then you're basically one. So that's consistent with a gene of large effect, consistent with a pelvis specific null mutation in PIDX1. That's good. More sort of smoking gun might be if we see some of that asymmetry. Remember, there's so few genes that cause asymmetry in the genome, the vertebrate genome. So what we did is then go to a slightly different collection in the same stretch of rock, we went to 877 fish, and we essentially measured right side versus left side of the pelvic vestiges, and then asked, are they asymmetric? So in the next plot, negative numbers over here are asymmetries. So of those 877 fish, 74% had that left larger asymmetry. That's significantly more than half. And then um, paired t-test showed that they're significantly left biased. So we also have this phenotypic signature. So the story so far is consistent with our hypothesis that PIDX1 is involved here. In the extant fish, PIDX1 is recessive. The way that it operates, um, you need sort of two pelvic specific knockouts to the enhancers to get your left bias reduction. Um, and so we also thought, well, maybe the action of that gene in Duricis would also sort of match that. <clears throat> and remember that selection in the system exists for armor loss almost immediately, right? So we get that full armor form come into the population. And for at least four armor traits, number of dorsal spines, number of, sort of plates along the back, and then a couple of length traits for pelvic spines and pelvic girdles, you get these reductions almost immediately. So it suggests that the environment wants low armored fish, but pelvic score did this sort of strange delay for a while. 
and then started reducing. Right? And so um, in a nice paper by G et al. in 2019, they did some simulations thinking about PIDX1 enhancers called PEL in modern sickleback populations. And they showed that one, PEL is in this a region that's highly fragile. So you could be sitting there waiting for these mutations to arise, um, but that it would take a while. Their simulation showed it would take a while for those to arise and get to high enough frequency that you would start to see the phenotype and selection could act. And the amount of time that they simulated was relatively consistent with the amount of time that we were waiting for the fossil lineage to start changing. So we have three pieces of a story that suggests that null mutations in PIDX1 are helping to drive some of this pelvic reduction here. Um, gene of large effect, left larger asymmetry, recessive, shared across a number of different organisms. And we submitted that story to the American naturalist and they said, no way. Um, one of the reviewers was like, this is pure speculation. Um, and that, you know, any other gene in the genome or sets of genes in the genome could be involved here. And that's fair. Um, we are speculating. We are in the fossil record. We can't sequence anything. And so then I guess the question is, is it fair speculation? Can we make that claim? Um, so we need a locus that is a decent candidate based on what we know about it in extant things. Gene of large effect acts in the pelvis specifically without screwing up anything else in the genome. Um, acts recessively, that would be consistent with modern stuff, um, and then causes that left larger asymmetry, which is quite rare. And so if you, you know, look at the kind of overlap of that Venn diagram, it's relatively small. Um, so we thought that it's reasonable, and we thank the American Naturalist Reviewer for helping us tighten our arguments, um, and then we were able to publish it. And um, I didn't talk about it today, if you're interested, Go find the paper. We also talked about why we think that there's other genes that are also involved, some modifying genes that are dealing with size as opposed to count and sort of that categorical drop. So that's the story about trying to infer some genetic architecture from the fossil record. With the rest of the time today, I'm gonna to try and make another inference from these data where we're gonna try and talk about reproductive isolation it evolves during that bit of evolution when that armored form, highly armored form showed up and then evolved reduced armor, okay? And this is motivated by Darwin again, um, right? His sharpest critique of his big book was that here's this book on the origin of species and we don't have any observable data on what he called the mystery of mysteries, how do species form, right? Here he is with this hypothesis that Earth's diversity is arising through the gradual accrual of small differences between these lineages over many generations under natural selection. If that's true, why don't we see it in the fossil record, right? Why is not every geological formation, every stratum full of these intermediate links? This is the most serious objection which can be urged against my theory. And he wrote a whole chapter, chapter nine, in the origin to deal with this problem. And so he did the you know, usual thing. He said, well, the fossil record is spotty. And then he also proposed a biological reason for why it might be spotty beyond just the fact that fossilization is hard and all of these things that you know. Um, and he said that he basically proposed this model of speciation where varieties, right, these incipient species are at first very local. Okay? They don't spread widely. They don't supplant their parent form. They don't become detectable essentially until after they've spread widely, which means that you're not gonna pick up that initial divergence in the fossil record because it happens so locally and in such a small population. Meyer, Meyer sort of picked up on this um, about a hundred years later, talked about uh, speciational evolution, right? This parapatric speciation idea is that you get speciation in these peripheral populations. They get beyond kind of the home range of the, the species range of the home of the parent species. They're in a new environment. They're going, undergoing profound genetic restructuring, et cetera, et cetera, and they might rapidly evolve to become a new species. And so here we have this question. Can we, can we detect that phyletic evolution becoming speciation, right? And so we would probably need you know, a fossil record with ancestral and derived populations, a nice strategy, stratigraphy that follows the population through time, 
some way to detect or infer natural selection, um, and then some way to infer reproductive isolation if we want to use the biological species concept. And so I'm going to try and make the case for the rest of this talk that we do this in this fossil lineage. So uh, first, I do, do want to acknowledge my collaborators again. Mike Bell has been instrumental in this. A um, couple of great undergraduate researchers who have led various aspects of data collection and analysis. We got some loans from Dolph Schluter at UBC, and um, there's a field museum component to this work. Uh, we collaborated with Caleb McMahon um, to do a lot of x-rays of extant fish using the x-ray machine down in the basement um, of the field museum. So here's the scenario that I'm going to try and try and build here. Okay. So we have that lineage two, that highly armored form that gets into this new environment and begins evolving in this periphery, right? It comes from this other population somewhere else in the lake basin, gets into this place that favors, favors low armor and starts evolving. And I've already shown you those three traits that evolve that are armor based significant differences in dorsal spine number, pelvic score number, but we measured a bunch of other traits and showed that they differ too, things like body size, which are super important and things like assorted mating. And then a number of traits here, these abbreviations are Greek to you, but there are swimming traits here, there are armor traits here, and there are eating traits here. We have almost this sort of you know, wholesale change in this fish. It's a very different fish by the time you get to the end relative to the beginning of this lineage. Here's graphical form, um, all of those different traits ordered by sort of how strong their change is, okay? So 14 of 17 traits significantly different from start to end of this single population evolving. And here's the scenario I have in mind. Right, so we start with the source lake of lineage two somewhere else in the lake basin away from the depositional environment can contain predators with an armored stickleback. It gets into this depositional environment, starts evolving towards low armor, and a bunch of other traits change so that by the end of this sequence, you have this low armor form. Lots of differences. And then the question is, you know, given what's going on in the rest of the lake basin, if this new low armored form came in contact again with its source, would they be reproductively isolated? Some range expansion or some flooding or whatever, would they recognize each other as mates or not? Would they be new species? <clears throat> so does, does this, did this result in early speciation, right? The paleontologist morphological species concept, you'd have to decide yes or no. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. It depends on how you feel that morphological characters sort of contribute to speciation. We can have debate about that. Um, but, you know, somebody who's steeped in the biological species concept then asks, all right, well, you've got all that morphological change. Is there reproductive isolation here? And we're gonna compare to extant stickleback again and see if we can, see if we can make some, some claim in that, in that regard. So, Modern stickleback, in addition to being known for that marine to freshwater, high armor to low armor transition, are known for these benthic lenetic species pairs. So this is a pair of fish from a single lake in British Columbia, where you have two forms. You have this big benthic bottom feeding form that doesn't swim all that much and it just sort of hangs out in the, in the shrubbery. And then you have this limnetic form that's out in the open water, swimming a lot, um, eating plankton. And these two forms are reproductively isolated. So people have done experiments, they can cross just fine in the lab, but in the field, ecologically, they rarely hybridize and the hybrids that they do form have low fitness. We've done these in experimental lakes, they've also looked in um, sort of wild populations, there's assorted mating. It's enough that they're called species pairs. No taxonomist is coming along and actually named them as different species, but at the very least we have reproductive isolation. And there's five to seven lakes, depending on how you count, where this has happened. So what we figured we'd do is we'd measure the same traits that we were able to get from the fossils, do it in these extant forms. So there's those 17 traits. <clears throat> 
we borrowed a bunch of specimens from Dolph Schluter, five lakes. And then the idea here is, well, what if we go into some sort of morpho space? So here I've got girdle length on the x-axis, body size on the y-axis. Maybe we can get a multivariate mean for the benthic form, multivariate mean for the limnetic form, and we can draw a vector between them. And that's our divergence vector. That's the amount that the benthic form is different from the limnetic form in this two-dimensional space. You can imagine doing that in a three-dimensional space. And you can imagine doing that in an n-dimensional space and come up with some sort of distance metric between your reproductively isolated modern forms. So then we figured, all right, well, we'll measure D in the fossils and we'll measure D in the extant forms and see what they look like. So hypothetically, these are not real data. Imagine that all of the species pair populations where we have known reproductive isolation, they're assortatively mating. If morphological difference is say here on this divergence axis. If the fossils show up in kind of a similar range, then maybe we can be a little more, more confident saying that reproductive isolation has evolved. <laughs> or if the fossils haven't diverged that far, maybe we would say, all right, well, they are significantly different, but they didn't match these things that we know are reproductively isolated in nature. We haven't quite gotten there. So that's the scenario we're looking for. Here's some real data. Here's the distance value that we measured between the start and the end point of that fossil lineage for the 17 traits. And then <clears throat> for the benthic species pairs, here's what we see. So we had five pairs. The mean divergence for the benthic limnetic pairs is about there, and the fossils are greater than four of the five. So the fossils are diverging, have diverged as much as or more than most of those benthic limnetic species pairs. So if you're willing to say, all right, well, something was dragged along with all of those traits that generates reproductive isolation, maybe we have a case for it here. And again, I'll say, you know, one of those traits was size, and we know that size is important in assorted mating and stickleback. So if we're okay with that, then we can also ask, well, how long did it take for reproductive isolation to evolve? And here we're kind of getting at that by saying, all right, this is that right here, this D value right here is D, is this D value right here. So this is where the fossil lineage was diverged from its starting point after about 16,000 years of evolution. What I've plotted now is every time step that we have. So time step one, time step two, time step three, distance from first population. So you can see that that D value sort of picks up through time. And then it gets you know beyond the mean speciation distance for the five extant pairs in about, what did it say, 8,000 years, which is somewhat consistent with how long it would have taken the benthic limnetic forms to diverge since they're all post-glacial, right? So we seem to have um, a number of different pieces of evidence pointing in the same direction. So we might have some evidence here for incipient speciation. What does this add to our you know, knowledge of speciation beyond just being a cool case of something in the fossil record? Um, one, it fits this idea of ephemeral speciation relatively nicely. So this is a model that was put forth by Rosenblum and others in 2012, but built on a number of other ideas that were in the literature that basically said, there's this interesting observation that some of our adaptive radiations have speciation on the order of you know, hundreds of species per lineage per million years, right? Think about the cichlids and in, in the rift lakes. But if you go to phylogenies with the fossil records, you estimate speciation rates orders of magnitude lower. And the ephemeral speciation model reconciles that by saying, well, you can pick up a whole bunch of species in a short amount of time, but they all go extinct or they get absorbed through hybridization or something like that. <clears throat> and so this Dorissa system seems to fit that a little bit. Um, we have this rapid evolution of reproductive isolation over you know, four to 8,000 years, um, but it's impermanent. So this stickleback diversity goes extinct we don't, I haven't shown you that rock record, but in another few hundred years, um, this killifish shows up and the stickleback disappear. We're gonna look at the paleoecology of that as well to see if we can figure out what happened there. But, um, so we have an extinction event and there was also an extinction event that started this story, right? Where lineage one went extinct and lineage two showed up. Okay. So we have a lot of impermanence in, in the stickleback record. And then 
<clears throat> it also fits a little bit in this punctuated equilibrium story, right? So Gould and Eldridge famously proposed that punctuated equilibrium is this major reorganization of genetic architecture at speciation events. That's why you see all this change when speciation happens. And that's, of course, arguable the pattern in the first place. But Fatuma came along and said, well, what if it's just that you only see novelty at speciation events because that's when it becomes concrete. That's when it sinks, right? As opposed to just a bunch of lineages creating this novelty and then disappearing before we see them in the fossil record. Right? So if we didn't get lucky here and have a you know, mining company come along and decided that they wanted some diatomite, right? this story wouldn't, wouldn't exist. We wouldn't have detected it. It wouldn't be in the fossil record anywhere. Um, and this might explain why stickleback are kind of this weird phenomenon, right? They're famous for this microevolution, all of this repeated adaptive radiation into fresh water independently across the world. And yet there's only five gasterosseids, right? Because a lot of their diversity is ephemeral too. A lot of the environments in which they're diversifying are just getting wiped out by glaciers over and over and over. So, um, don't have time to talk about adaptation geometry. Um, we're gonna talk about Fisher and his adaptive walks and such. So if people wanna ask about that, talk to you after. Um, the one thing I'll do is I'll finish on some future directions. Got a career work to continue some of, career work to continue some of this work. Um, I pitched trying to look at sort of multivariate trends. Let's get all of those traits for really fine resolution see if we can see how traits are changing in concert or not as you get this adaptation and whether or not trait covariances are biasing that evolution. And so I just um, sort of brought on board an excellent new postdoc called Diacopo, um, who's an anthropologist by training, but wants to do some fish biology. Um, and so he's gonna work on that and he's already bringing some new ideas looking at paleoecology and stratigraphy in this system. Um, so we're gonna do a little bit of that too. Is Yasmina in the audience? Meeting with her later, I think. I'm also tempted to like try for some ancient DNA. I don't know, it's only 10 million years old. Um, but anyways, we're gonna do some paleoecology. So here's some diatom, uh, diatoms that Jacopo has already isolated from some of these sediments and maybe we'll be able to track change in diatom communities to get at some of these questions of what's the ecological basis of evolution in the system. And we're sorting out the stratigraphy, making sure that it is annual layers and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's the work that's ongoing with this system now. And with that, um, I'll wrap up, say thank you all for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Good job. Uh, I was interested in the asymmetry that you showed before about the pelvis. Mm -hmm. So you show like a, a majority, like 75% had the left larger asymmetry, mm -hmm. but like some 25% had a right asymmetry instead of symmetrical. I don't know, I was just yeah. wondering what's going on, what drives that, if not the same gene, and what's the implication of ha having that kind of asymmetry? Yeah, that's a good question. So what's going on with those right biased individuals that have smaller pelvises, but not left bias. I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question, right? So it probably suggests that there's other epistatic interactions going on here, that there's some other genes that are contributing to some of this variation. It may also be plasticity, just developmental noise. And you're significantly larger on the left, um, but it may be that some individuals, even though PIDX1 comes up, they're just by chance going a little bit right. Um, but then there's also these a few populations of extant stickleback that have reduced their pelvises and they are right biased. So there's three that I know of um, in the kind of Alaska area where that plot is essentially flipped. And so PIDX1 is not involved in those populations and that's waiting for somebody to go do the quantitative genetics to figure out what is. So it's probably just complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. So, um, 
Uh, you focused on on the averages, right, of the trades uh, moving through mm -hmm. time. Could you talk a little bit about uh, variations, so the the variance uh, in the trade. So did the population start uh, uh, very variable, and then as it reaches an optimum, does it get less variable, or yeah, maybe not? Uh, I'll have observed on that. Yeah, Let's see if I can. So for pelvic score, at least, and did you see any evidence of the like uh, benthic, limnatic uh, form, or it was basically mm. just one thing all over? Yeah. So for pelvic score, at least, at that replacement event, there's no variation. There were all threes, right? Um, so at least for that gene of large effect. There were no heterozygotes or homozygotes for the recessive or whatever. Um, as far as how does variance in the other traits evolve through time too, that's one of the questions that we're also interested in. Right? What's happening? What's happening in the variance, and how does that contribute to the rate and sort of trajectory of change? For sure. Um, <clears throat> actually, I actually have somebody who's sort of doing that analysis now, but early days. Um, you had a follow-up question about. Yeah, yeah because the, what made me think of it is after you showed the lakes in which uh, one ancestral population split into two forms. Yeah. Um, presumably, that's preceded by uh, some period in which there is large variation yeah, in those so, traits, and then they split or something like this. Is, is this? Do you observe any sign of this? Or yeah, so the hypothesis for how the benthic limnetic species pairs form, the extant forms, is that there was an initial colonization where the fish um, sort of evolved reduced armor and became benthic. And then there was a second one that came in and then there was character displacement. So you got the highly limnetic and highly benthic. Um, in most, and so that story is quite famous, but there's only five to seven of those populations in the world that we've detected. Most stickleback populations are generalists where you have, you know, Things in the middle, some that are more benthic, some that are more limnetic, but it's single population. Um, and then you might go to a lake that has a lot of benthos, and they're more on one end of the spectrum and more limnetic, and they're more, more on the other. <clears throat> in this population, I didn't show the data. The data aren't mine. There was one nice study. There's one nice study in the fossils where they looked at um, scratches on the teeth essentially and showed that at the start of, let's see, do I have this right? At the start of the trajectory, they were mostly limnetic, eating limnetic -y things, and then they evolved benthicness through time. So, whatever the change in the environment was also led to a change in diet. Um, another you know, bit of evidence that maybe there would be some reproductive isolation if they're also feeding in different places than they were to interact. Um, yeah. Uh, I just want to say thanks very much, Yoel. Really wonderful talk. Um, if anyone's interested in going to lunch, uh, we're going to go to lunch at the Bistro, so please feel free to, to join us. And thanks again, everyone, for coming out today. And yeah. Thank you. <laughs>